Welcome back to March or Die. I can't believe I'm about ready to say what I'm gonna say, but I have an incredible guest for this episode. I'm sure you guys have already seen um, by the label <laughs> of the video, but I have Mr. Scott Stewart from the Madison Scouts. He was the core director for a very long time and he's gonna give us some insight into the Madison Scouts, kind of what it was like, um, the philosophy, all kinds of different cool things that I'm sure you guys are gonna love. This is gonna be a two part video, so make sure that you look for part number two coming out very, very soon. But without any further delay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over now to our interview with Mr. Scott Stewart. All righty. All right. Wow, I can't tell you how excited I am. Sorry for the headphones, but it's the only way I can hear you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Wow, well, thank you for joining me. Um, and thank you for watching my video. I'm right. really, really surprised to hear from you, but I'm glad. So I'm very, okay. very uh, thankful for that. Um, so kind of, uh, I kind of want to just leave this kind of open to what you you would like to talk to as well, uh, talk about as well. Sure. Um, but I, you know, just kind of, maybe we can start with um, how you got started with Madison Scouts and kind of what your role turned into and evolved into. Sure. Okay, are we going now? We are going. All right. Let's see, I uh, joined the Scouts back in 1968 as a baritone player. Aged out in 1974, uh, was assistant director the next two years, and I became the director in 77, and became the executive director of the corporation, as well as the program coordinator for the Corps in 1980. And those all lasted through till uh, 2002, when I left the Corps at the end of that season. Wow. That's a long time. Yeah. That's a long time. Just feel free to ask me. I mean, things are on your mind. Just ask sure. me. Sure. Sure. So um, one of the things that um, I was kind of doing some research, and um, we'll just go ahead and lead off with this. Why not? Um, I found a video of somebody recorded you doing your whistle oh, to, yeah. to wake the core up. Why don't you tell me about how that started? Well, it started way back in um, my first term as director back in 77. I wanted the way to get the guys up in the morning and show respect for them and gentle. And at the same time, um, it was pretty funny. And so every morning when I'd come in, I'd, by the end of the time, the guys had been able to just on their own know what was going to happen. They could hear me inhale and they'd wake up. <laughs> so it was pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> but I'd walk in in the morning and I'd whistle up from William Tell Overture, the da, 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 da. And I'd sing through that or whistle through that whole thing. And you'd see guys pop up and I'd let them know what was going on for the day. And we'd go on from there. Wow. That's pretty, that's a good way. That, I mean, uh, we, we usually just had the lights turned on. Okay. Rehearsal starts in 20 minutes. Get up. <laughs> and we'd have to, you know, go into the shower or do whatever we're going to have to do. So that was, that was a very considerate thing. You know, um, um, just a little bit about me. I actually marched in freelancers um, from 1989 to 1993. And that's kind of where I discovered the Scouts, Madison Scouts. So, and it was actually um, very, it actually is what got me to do it. Madison Scouts, um, because my friend, he marched um, 1988 in freelancers. And then he he talked me, he was talking all, all through bands, he said, oh, man, you got to come out. You got to do it. You got to march on course. The most amazing thing ever. Oh, my God, you got to do that. You got to do it. You got to do it. So finally, I decided to do it. And um, the night before our Sunday rehearsal, he he goes, oh, man, you got to watch drum corps because I'd never seen drum corps before. I've heard about it because um, we had some people that had marched Blue Devils, um, mm -hmm. 87, 88, 89. Um, so, you know, they, they talked about it, but I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> But but he he put in his VHS of 88 finals. So I'm watching Blue Devils. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And then, you know, Santa Clara and then the Madison Scouts. And I was just like, oh, my God. I go, 
I'm going to do that. And he's like, yeah, you're going to do that. Well, not that, but you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be in drum corps. So Madison actually is what really turned me on to drum corps. Just the, the, the power, the, the class, the, you know, the oomph, um, which I think is a, tra- is a huge trademark of the Madison Scouts, you know, just that classy, jazzy, we're in your face, we're going to entertain you, whether you, you well, you are going to like it, <laughs> but, you know, but kind of just that whole thing. So that's kind of how I got started with Madison Scouts. And then I saw them in the 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, you know, so I, I got to experience some, some amazing shows. Um, and then in the series I was doing was really focusing on the 1990s. Um, but why don't we go back a little bit to the eighties and talk a little bit about, um, when you're the director and, and starting in 77 through the whole entire eighties, what was kind of like the, the philosophy of the scouts, the drive of the scouts during that time? Well, when I was there, it, it never changed. Uh, in fact, the reason I stayed involved with the Corps after I aged out was the fact that I knew that we could do a better job of taking care of the guys. I mean, as far as treating them with respect and not just part of the product, but, actually members of a fraternity that the whole staff bought into as well. Um, Our staff, by the time we got to 1980, almost the whole staff was um, Madison Scout alumni. The reason for that was there was a couple of reasons. One was that they had, they were looked at as the big brothers. They had come through the core. They had learned what they learned. They learned to appreciate it. And now it was their turn to give back and teach or design. Now I had the advantage of course, of having incredible amounts of talent in the core and able to watch a guy develop over his three or four or five years with the scouts. At that time, I could say, you're, you're ready to be a staff member. So it was top quality people that I got to observe for years and been able to cho- choose the ones that were the cream of the crop. And that's one of the reasons that the core was so consistent was that the, the bond between the staff and the core was a genuine bond of all experiencing the same thing. Yeah. That's all. also one of the reasons that you, you talked um, about our style at one point on when you're watching the show about the toe raise and so forth. The reason that happened was our philosophical approach was that you have to do everything you do to the very best of your ability. And that came from myself down through the newest member of the core. When we told the guys we we're going to give them a great show, we give them a great show. When we told them to give them the tools they needed to become successful, we did that. We did shows that we knew the crowd would love, and that was a reward to the guys. I mean, you know, to be able to see the crowd go nuts every single night for what they were putting their hard work into. Well, another facet of our philosophy was that everybody is important and everybody deserves to be treated well. And so that not only was within the core, but without, outside the core. When you pull into a facility, you're, you're um, friendly to the janitor. You know, no matter what, you're good to the people out there. Because one of your goals was to make life just a little bit better for people. And we truly believed that. And again, so as we had people that came through the program, they brought those beliefs along with them. And it was my pleasure to be able to continue to stir it in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely did that. And, and I'll, I'll share, share a little story with you. Um, in 1991, we um, both the Madison Scouts and the freelancers, and I think Vanguard, but I could be wrong. I, it's you know I'm old now, so I don't remember everything clearly. But we were all together in Montreal, Canada, and we all had a day off. Um, <clears throat> and several members of the Madison Scouts, I believe, they're in the contra line. Um, God, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, some I, I know one of my freelancer of. Uh, family will remember but they were just the nicest people just so just you know just fun and entertaining but they were also very respectful um and they they hung out with us and we had a great time and we just you know kind of bonded that that season so when you know some of the members would see them later on in the tour they were able to um you know, you know, talk to them and stuff like that. And we talked during, you know, we couldn't talk during retreat, but we'd see them during retreat and stuff. So, so you you did a good job. Um, The staff did a great job because classy organization, just everybody there is just super nice. Oh, good. Yeah. That's what we tried to make happen. And I I think we did succeed. Yeah, you definitely did. I mean, 
what was kind of the, um, cause in the late seventies, everybody was kind of doing like, we're going to pick this piece and, right, then, right. and then we're going to do a concerto <laughs> and then we're going right, to right. do Beethoven or something, or, right. you know, Tchaikovsky and, and a jazz piece. And then, so what was kind of the, the philosophy of like show design, especially in the eighties when it was kind of starting to evolve into right. more of a, I guess like a thematic type approach. So what yep. was kind of, what was kind of the, your guys's like process for putting that together? Well, it's interesting. One of the years, I, I was 23 years that I was in charge of the program. And one of the things that was different about it was in the beginning, like you said, it was just one piece and then the next piece. Um, as the 80s progressed, what we did was, it wasn't necessarily thematic, but it was stuff that fit together. And it fit together because we knew how to contour. We knew how to put the flow into it. We knew how to have music that actually um, was music and um, melodically oriented so that people could whistle it when they were leaving the stadium. Um, one of my favorite shows out of all those years that I was involved with that part of it, 1983. And that year was an attempt, I remember at our first staff meeting, I said, we can do this and let's make it work. But it was to take three completely different pieces of music. The opener was a classical piece, Colas Brunian. Um, the next number was Strawberry Soup. Mm. And the last number was from Cats. And so you had all these three different types and people would go, how can that work? Well, it worked because we knew how to make it flow from one place to the other and how to make each cell not only within itself, but with the rest of the program. So that was 83. And after that, what I it was different back then finding music because now you've got a computer, you can find anything you want. <laughs> yeah. Back then, back then I, I did a lot of research. Like every fall, I would spend hours and hours and hours at the library and record shops just finding stuff that I didn't know. And also encourage the rest of the staff to do that and encourage members and anyone else who wanted to have input into it. We were willing to listen to anything. And then it would obviously be a situation where we had to figure out what was going to work. One thing I did was if I found a piece of music or even a segment of a piece of music that appeared to have some worth that might be good someday, I would write it down in this little journal. And so as years went on, I'd look through it and look at it and go, ah, I remember this piece now. This was something that maybe could work with a little bit of um, attention to it. And so that was, that was an interesting part of it. Also, everybody was encouraged to look for music on the staff and in the core and were very open to their ideas. And well, one thing that made the show so good was that as a staff, we worked together. It was really a team effort. And the people that were there not only were talented, but they did appreciate one another and they had respect for one another. And we had start that out every year at the beginning that first staff meeting would be, hey, the reason we're all here is we want to make something great. We want to be able to give to the guys what we had when we were there. And we're best of friends, so we're going to work together on this. And that was a key factor in it. We really were best of friends. And we had a design team that, although it, um, it progressed over the years, they were all good people. And they were people that had come through the core. And so it was just a pleasure doing it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just from my perspective, I'm, you know, I, I only got to, like I said, experience Madison really from 88 going forward, mm -hmm. um, live, at least live. But you could really tell just the way that everything was put together was super, super thought it thought out. Like everything, like all the music, you 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 could have if if you didn't know what the music was, you would go, oh, that that's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the same you know piece or a sort of part of a big movement or you know um, symphony or something like that. You know, right. and and that that's one of the keys I think to. Um, to great show design is no matter what your your music is, no matter what your drill is, it all has to synchronize perfectly together. Because um, I've been a show designer for 30 years and a lot of times I'll help with, you know, picking out music or, you know, then, then we, we want, you know, if we have a theme in mind, like what music would fit that or how we want to construct it. So it, it is, like you said, it's super crucial, you, you know, to, to pick, not only music that you you know you're gonna love, but that the kids are gonna love and love to play and perform. 
um, night after night. Cause it's, I mean, you're doing four, sometimes 40, 40 to 50 shows, you know, yeah. and you got to play that music over and over again <laughs> and you got to love it and you got to make the right. crowd love it too. So I, I think that's just the amazing thing about drum core itself is just the, you know, I, I didn't get it when I marched for at least a couple of years, like how, how big the activity was. Um, I was just a little small part in it, but I think, I think as I got kind of older and matured a little bit, I kind of realized like I was in something bigger than myself. Right. And, and it really yeah. takes a whole group effort to make that occur. You know, you can't just magic just, just doesn't happen out of thin air. It's sometimes created, you know, it's fostered, it's, you know, grown. And then the magic comes out of it, you know, after a while. So. Exactly. And one of the things, one of the things with drum corps, there, there was at times a, like many art forms, they get to a point where they almost take themselves too seriously. I mean, it becomes to a point where they're they're smarter than the audience and they're going to put something together that is either going to teach the audience something or else is going to show just how dumb they are. And I, I didn't appreciate that. That came from a number of the other groups. We, we certainly didn't buy into that. Um, the thing is, is that I also learned with show design certain things that you do that are so good that you should do them again. There's other things that maybe after once that was enough for that one. But there are certain things that come up design-wise from a musical standpoint or a visual standpoint that are just guaranteed to be a hit. And you want to keep those. You don't have to you don't have to be avant-garde to the point of, of losing the people that are sitting there watching you. Exactly. And what's interesting is actually I found a video of you um, and I'll probably put it in with this piece um, of you talking to the core. I think it was 1994 about um, I wish I would have had it so we could watch it together. But I know um, what you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's basically just kind of, you know, I think it's before the the show and you're trying to, you know, just talking to the kids about kind of about, you know, how some cores just literally commit suicide, just trying to get the show out. And just instead right. of just instead of it just being a natural thing that is enjoyed by the audience and everyone. Over the years, we built a very beautiful thing here. And as I listened to some of the other cores warmed up, I listened to some of their philosophies, it made me realize just how beautiful things are here, how beautiful they can be. We've got one group that's waging war on us. There's several others that are suicidal about what the scores are saying. I never hear a mention about achievement level or about entertaining an audience. And somehow over the years, we figured out that that's what it's all about. Because those are things that you have control over. And those are things that are based in good values and good principles. It's not the easy way, but it's the right way. And I think that was like, that was a great message because it's like, why kill yourself trying to please them? You know, the, the judges and all the, the stuff when it's all about the, the fans. It's about the fans. Right. Exactly. Um, I mean, and, and I got to ask you this question. This is ever since that you reached out to me and I started thinking about it. I, I there, there's a rumor that, that I heard that, I mean, A, that you guys never attended critique and B, that you guys used to just throw out the judges tapes. Oh, let's see. <laughs> On that, the reasoning behind it, first of all, um, basically what I watched happen my first years running it, and I believed it, was that you had to, let's see, I want to put this, you had to not enjoy yourself almost to be successful. I mean, it, our guys, the thing we taught them was, if they're doing the very best they can, and we as a staff have done the very best we could, that's what's going to pay off, and that's what's going to work. And I think in drum corps, because it's not objective, it's subjective, the evaluation of it. You're going to have people's opinions. And unfortunately, after they get established, they stay that way. I used to say that whatever they put you in the beginning of the season would be there at the end of the season. But basically, 
I think it came down to you just had to do what you knew was right, and you can't have the experience ruined for you. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's kind of one of the, um, I mean, I was in, the core I was in wasn't like super liked. I mean, let's oh. just be, I'm going to be honest. Um, the crowd loved us, um, right. you know, everywhere we went, but we weren't critically acclaimed. Um, but, you know, I, I marched with some of the, the best players I've ever played with in my entire life. Exactly. Um, still to this day, these, these guys are just monsters you know, in playing and stuff. Um, so, I mean, I kind of understand. I mean, and I, maybe that's kind of why I always liked the Madison Scouts. I actually really wanted to go march there in 92. Mm -hmm. my, my friend and I were like, oh, man, we got to go march Madison. We got to go march Madison. We just couldn't make it happen. But, you know, that was kind of because we, we had seen kind of the, you know, 89, 90, 91. We, it, and I love the toes thing. I, I used to teach that to my kids, like, let's get the toes up, you know, and the whole toes thing. And, and when we marched and freelancers, we tried to do, oh, let's get the toes up like Madison, you know, kind of that whole thing. Just because we loved the we love this, the vibe of it and the, how, how, how effortless the marching looks as they're gliding, you know, even though there is a lot of effort. I mean, you're moving like crazy, well, but. The reason we were able to do that was that every day we put an hour into basics visually, stretch and basics, and they worked on everything to the minutia down to the point where everything was done exactly the same. And I still marvel at it when I watch us on a video and I watch that leg lift and I watch the the toe roll. I mean, it's just incredible style. You can't you can't find that kind of style um, everywhere. Um, jumping back to your other question I got lost on, <laughs> you talked about going to critiques. Mm -hmm. What happened there was I found that, and I watched it in every core out there, no matter what you told the core during the day, if you went into critique and got pissed off about it and came back to the staff vehicle afterwards complaining you were basically setting up a bad situation for the guys because if it's not supposed to be the main criteria, why are you guys so upset? So I stopped going to critique after I found that I was too argumentative and it was just not, it was not healthy, I didn't feel. The rest of the staff, I didn't tell them they couldn't go, but I said, if you're going to go to critique, when you come back to the core afterward, you better not have let that affect you at all. You better still be the same guy you were before the scores were announced. And the same guy that that put in all the effort to make you as good as you are. So, if you're going to be on the if you're going to be on the staff and you're going to go to critique, you've got to handle yourself well, and you cannot let it affect your real reason for being here, which is teaching these guys how to be the best group you possibly can. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I see some. I don't know. I, I guess I see value in some of it because I've done critiques, and you know, now that I'm older. Um, for like band and stuff. So I, I think it's really helpful for band um, I agree. because, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're learning, you're getting experience kind of understanding like how people are perceiving your show. But I think at your guys's level, I agree with you. I don't know what are they going to, this is the show we want to, you know, give out. This is a show we right. want to perform. Why do we need to talk to you about why we're doing it <laughs> or why, why, or what we're doing? Cause it's, it's not going to change their mind. Nope. I mean, so, I totally agree with that. So anyhow, that's that was that. As far as throwing around judges' tapes, we didn't really do that too often because that would have been, you know, just as wrong as the other side. So yeah. basically what we did do with them, and this is back before we had CDs and so forth, um, what we would do in the year to get ready for the season, we would make sure that by the time we got into December, we had the show set and we were already working on things. And by the end of January or before the end of January, we were able to send the guys out all the music, including a tape with their music on that, you know, that was generated. Um, now, that's pretty funny because we had the cassette tapes every show. We just saved them in a big bag. <laughs> and when we got to the time in January, when we had to send it out to the guys, that's where we put the music on. And so it, did, <laughs> it served a, a great purpose. Very true. <laughs> Got to recycle. <laughs> But again, you know, the, the, the point about working with bands and judging bands, you're in a different situation because you are trying to give them materials they need to get better at what they do. Also, it's only a part of the band program so that it's not so intense as it is at a, as a level of drum corps. And so you're, you can help them out in a way that you can't help the drum corps because so much, once, once you've gotten to a point in drum corps, 
you can't really get much better. I mean, I'll look at Madison for the 20 some years I did the program and worked with the greatest group of guys on earth that um, that was, you know, a, a level that you couldn't really, I can't look at it and go, you know, this year we were great and this year we weren't. We were great every year. And it was because the approach was the same every year as far as philosophical. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's kind of, I mean, you know, a score, a score is someone's interpretation of whether or not they like you or not. That, 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 that's kind of like what a score is to me. Um, even, even when, like when I teach some of my groups, I, I kind of try to make sure I tell them, I go, I go, this, your score is going to shift from once one show to another show based on who's there with you. So it also has to do with like expectation too. So it's like, you can't really look at scores like a definitive, this is how good you are. This is how not good you are. A score is just a score. Um, to me, what, what matters, I think to me is like, did we have a great show? Did, did, did we try our best? Did we, as a staff, did we, put together the best thing that we could for that group. Did that group enjoy what they did? Did the crowd enjoy what we performed? You know, all those things are kind of the more important things to me than a score. I mean, well, there's, most, I mean, most there's of the course. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Most of course say the same thing. It's whether or not you're really doing it. And that's yeah. what it came down to with preparation as far as having a program ready for the guys and having it done right the first time even though there are some years we had to adjust a bit, but for the most part, you wanted to make sure that when they hit that field the first time, they were great because not only did they have to do that so that they felt that they were becoming better at what they did, but you had an audience that may only see you one time each year and you better be great for them because that's what their impression is going to be. So that first show is just as important as the last show. Yeah, exactly. Um, I did have a question. So I, I a lot of the music that the Madison Scouts does is like Spanish flavored, at least in the 90s. And I know that's not always, you know, I mean, you guys have done other types of music, too. But is there a particular reason why? Is it because it's just more you can put more flair into it, more flavor well, into it? You look at it in, in the 90s and even the 80s. Well, 80s was different because, you, like you said before, we can take different pieces and, and put them all together. And it doesn't have to be quite a thematic. Um, the Spanish stuff, really, we only did it, really, other than Malaguena a couple other times. We did it three years, 94, 95, 96. 94, we put it together, and we did that one just because we we knew that um, that Spanish music would work, and we were able to take three different kinds of music and put that together. They are all Span Spanish-flavored. Um, 95. That was one that it fell right into a group, and we took things that we had learned here before. And the '95 show was tremendous, and '96 yeah. <laughs> was the was the third year of it, and it went all the way back to like we ended the first year with the company front, and the second year we started it with company front. It was just supposed to be a continuation of what had happened the year before, but other than that, I don't think I I don't think we had that much of a Spanish influence. I mean, after that we went into the the pirate show and then after that we did the show and, and i want to talk about that that show after the pirate show sometime because i want to explain to you what we did with it and i think that that maybe it escaped a lot of people that's what was actually going on in that one then the jesus christ superstar piece which was man uh that that came off so great i mean there was crowd just tearing the stadium down more than we had even experienced prior to that and yeah then, i mean I mean, that whole decade was just a, that's my favorite decade of scouts. I <laughs> just kind of every show. I mean, and, and you're right. I probably misspoke when we're talking about, you know, a lot of, maybe it's just because I, that's the shows I remember the most were the Spanish sure. ones, like 44, or 94, 95, 96, those, and you know, just amazing shows. Just yeah. blow your face off shows. And what an incredible interview so far. We saw part number two to come, and we're going to be talking about more things um, dealing with the Madison Scouts, so please don't miss that. So thank you guys so much for joining me on this video. If you have not subscribed now, it'd be a great time to do so, so you get notified when we have part number two coming out um, very, very soon, so you guys can get notified as soon as that happens. 
All right, well, thank you guys so very much. Please stay safe out there. I really appreciate all the support on this channel and all the new people that have been joining. I really, really want to welcome you to this channel and let you know that you're going to have quality entertainment here. All right, so thank you guys so much. Until the next video, march on.